Welcome to our Breastfeeding Your Baby class. I'm Vanessa Flood, your WIC Breastfeeding Peer Counselor. Today we're going to cover all the ins and outs of feeding your newborn baby, troubleshooting, and just getting you off to a great start. We know most babies will breastfeed within their first hour after birth, especially when they're skin to skin with their moms. Some things to think about. Were you breastfed as a baby? How about your siblings? Sometimes we find some babies are and some siblings aren't, depending on family circumstances. Do you know anyone who's breastfed their baby? We know that when you're getting breastfeeding information, it's always good to get some from people who have breastfed or who are pretty knowledgeable about breastfeeding. And what have you heard about breastfeeding? A lot of people know it's great for baby, it's made just for them, it's cheap. Anything else? Why do women choose to breastfeed? For some, it's just what their family does. Their moms, their grandmas, their aunts, their sisters, everyone just breastfeeds their baby. Others may have read that it's the best for baby, that it builds a strong immune system, that the milk changes day by day, even feeding to feeding, to best meet the needs of this baby. Others may choose it because it's cheaper than doing formula. And some might just be a little curious and think to themselves, maybe I'll try it. Have you given any thought as to why you might be considering breastfeeding? We know human milk is made for human babies. Breast milk has over 800 individual ingredients. Formula on average has about 100 to 125 ingredients. So when people say breast milk and formula are about the same, not so much. We know that breast milk is a living organism. If we put breast milk underneath a microscope slide, the cells will move around. Uh, some of those cells are what builds a very strong immune system to baby and protects them from getting sick. The chart has a whole bunch of ingredients listed that are really hard to see, but we wanted you to see in perspective the differences between breast milk and formula. And breastfeeding just isn't about healthy babies. It's also about healthy moms. We know that a breastfed mom has a lower incidence of osteoporosis, those weak bones later in life, less risk of cardiovascular or heart issues, less risk of diabetes in her lifetime. We also know that breastfeeding lowers a mom's risk of breast cancer. For every pregnancy a woman has, she reduces her risk of breast cancer by 7%. For every one year of breastfeeding, and that could be one baby nursed for one year or three babies nursed for four months each. But for every total year of breastfeeding, a mom reduces the risk of breast cancer by 4.3%, which is pretty incredible. Plus, we know that it compounds over generations. So for instance, my mother nursed me for a year, so I get a bonus 4.3% in life just starting out. I nursed my girls for over a year, so they get another bonus 4.3% from their mom, me, and another 4.3% from grandma. So just starting out in life, my girls are almost 9% less likely for breast cancer in their lifetime. Ovarian cancer is even more staggering. For 13 months of total breastfeeding, so one baby for 13 months or three babies for a total of 13 months, reduces a woman's risk by 63%. 31 total months of breastfeeding reduces her risk by 91%. That is incredible. Now, do we still need to get mammograms and pap smears? Absolutely. But statistically speaking, it is going to lower families' chances of these female cancers, which is pretty incredible. It's a nice way to change the genetic makeup of families and their dynamics. 
We also know that breastfeeding lowers the risk of postpartum depression, which makes sense if you can grow a baby, birth a baby, and feed a baby successfully, that's a pretty empowering thing. So how long should we breastfeed a baby for? The American Academy of Pediatrics, the AAP, recommends six months of exclusive breastfeeding. So just breast milk the first six months of baby's life. Then starting at six months through 12 months, add in appropriate solid foods, baby foods, and then 12 or more months as long as mutually desired by mom and baby. But what we do know is any amount of breast milk a mom gives a baby will stay with them forever. It's a great gift. A baby nursed one time right after delivery will be so much better than a baby off that was nursed three times. A baby that was nursed four times will be so much better off than a baby nursed two times. Three days is better than two days. One week is better than one day, and so on. Especially in those first few days after birth, moms have this milk called colostrum. It's baby's first milk. It's really thick and sticky and sweet, and it has straight antibodies to help build their little immune system and keep them from being sick. So even a couple days in the hospital will help your baby be so much healthier and will stay with them forever. So how do we make milk? It's all supply and demand. As soon as your baby is born, between five and 20 minutes later, your placenta will deliver. As soon as your placenta delivers, that's what tells your body, hey, let's make some milk. When your placenta is gone, moms have a big drop in progesterone, the hormone of pregnancy, and that's what starts your milk making process. So to make milk, we need to take milk out of your body. The more milk we take out of your body, the more milk your body will make. So as babies begin nursing, if they're latched on well and taking good amounts of milk out of the breast, that will stimulate a mom's pituitary gland to produce more prolactin and oxytocin hormone where milk is produced and ejected and then baby continues to drink the milk. The more milk out of a mom's body, the more milk your body will make. The more you pump, the more you make. Baby's nurse, the more you make. So there's no magic wand, no magic food or drink. It's all about milk removal. So how do breasts produce milk and how do babies nurse? This is a cross section of a woman's breast. All of the yellow is fatty globules that make up the girth, how big we are, how full our breasts are, what is our breast size. The mammary glands, those pink lumpy looking cells, is what makes the milk. Those are our milk making factories. Coming down from those mammary glands are all the milk ducts or roads that lead out to the nipple. And then the nipple has seven to 14 different holes that milk will come flying out of. You can't see those holes, but they are there and milk will come flying out of them when you go to nurse a baby or when you go to pump. So when a baby latches on, they need to take as much of that breast into the mouth as possible so that when a baby compresses the breast, it just squeezes those ducts or roads to shoot milk out of the nipple and then baby swallows it. Babies should not be nursing or sucking just on the nipple. The nipple is like the straw. If you chew on your straw, you get no milk and a chewed up straw. So the nipple almost rests all the way back to the back of baby's throat. So when the baby sucks on the breast and presses those ducts, milk shoots out, hits the back of their throat and they swallow and nothing should ever touch that little nipple. 
This is why breastfeeding should not hurt. It should not hurt if we feed our baby. Unfortunately, everyone just tells new moms it's going to really hurt for about six weeks. So just power through and then it'll be great. You'll fall in love with it. It'll be wonderful. But that's six long weeks of pain. It should not hurt if babies are latched on well. However, there is a learning curve and you've never nursed a baby before or it's been a few years. So the same hormonal changes of pregnancy occur after delivery. So nipples tend to be pretty tender and that tenderness peaks at seven to 10 days and then falls very quickly. It is hard with these little tiny mouths and these big breasts to sometimes get a really good latch at the beginning just because of those tiny little mouths. So sometimes we might damage those nipples in that first week, but we can work on a healing plan very quickly, work through that where we don't have any more problems. The most important point is if a baby latches on, it should be comfortable after the first 30 to 45 seconds. If it is still sharp and pinchy, we need to put your finger in the crook of their mouth, break that suction, take them off, and try to relatch again. There's no reason to take one for the team and let a baby nurse if they are not nursing well. If it really hurts, it's sharp and pinchy, babies are not getting any milk, and they're just chewing up their straw, which is your poor little nipple. So what does a good latch look like? This baby in the photo has a great wide latch. The wider the mouth, the better. You can see these little lips are kind of flared or flanged out. That kind of suction cups them to the breast so that they don't just slide off of the breast. You can see that this baby is tucked in really close to his mom's breast. Their little nostrils in their nose are flared off to the side so that babies can come really close and snug into the breast and still breathe. Mom has baby behind each ear with her finger and thumb so that we're not pushing on the back of baby's head. And this baby looks really comfortable. Plus, this should be comfortable for a mom. This is a great video on latching on a baby. It's called the flipple technique. Really, it illustrates that babies aren't just latching on the nipple. They need to come up underneath the breast and get as much breast into their little mouth as possible. If you think about eating a really big sandwich, the first thing you do is you kind of smash down that sandwich so it fits in your mouth. And then if you want to take the biggest bite possible, do you bite from the top or do you come in from the bottom? You should come in from the bottom to get the biggest bite possible. So as babies come in on the bottom of the breast and puts a lot of that bottom breast tissue in their little mouth, the nipples, the last thing that goes in and then their top jaw just kind of matches their bottom jaw for a nice wide open and a big mouthful for a full of breast tissue. I like this video because this newborn baby has their little mouth and this big breast and it illustrates what the previous video did about how babies come up from the underside of the breast and how close this sweet baby is tucked in. So here are some helpful hints to get breastfeeding off to the best start. Once baby's born, they will wipe baby off really quick to dry baby off so that they don't get too chilly. Then we'll roll baby skin to skin with mom. The nurses will put a nice warm blanket over both of you. And this is how we should stay for the next one to two hours, snuggling up with your sweet baby, seeing what they look like, working on names. We want to keep babies skin to skin with their moms for the first hour to two hours after delivery. 
We know that your baby lived inside of you for nine plus months and they love hearing your heartbeat, the sound of your voice, your chest rising and falling with each breath. Plus, by staying skin to skin, it stabilizes baby's blood sugars. So once the umbilical cord is cut, they have and they lose their endless buffet, sometimes their blood sugars can drop. But by you keeping them skin to skin, it keeps babies the perfect temperature so that they don't have to burn calories and energy trying to stay warm. You just keep them the perfect temperature. They breathe when you breathe and just pattern off of that. We also know that your chest, your breast, will always keep baby the perfect temperature on a healthy full-term baby. If mom's baby gets too cold while on your chest, your chest will rise up in temperature upwards of four degrees to heat baby up. If your baby gets too hot on your chest, your chest temperature will drop downwards of four degrees to cool baby down. And if that's not magic enough, if a mom has twins laying over her chest, if the baby on the right gets too hot, that side will cool down, and if the baby on the left gets too cold, her left side will heat up. Moms and babies are connected, even though you're not physically connected anymore. Skin to skin is the perfect habitat for your baby to stay immediately after delivery, those first few days, and even those first few weeks. Once mom has some great skin-to-skin -skin time, it's also great for partners to do or grandmas to do. Um, babies love snuggling in skin-to-skin. -to, -skin. to get breastfeeding off to the best start, we want to delay all routine procedures. That includes weights, footprints, eye ointments, baby's first shots. We just say, no thank you, when your sweet little nurse comes up and says, hey, would you like to see how big baby is? No thank you. You worked so hard for this baby. You deserve that one to two hours of snuggle time on your chest, skin to skin, and so does your baby. The majority of our local hospitals automatically delay all of these procedures until one to two hours after delivery. And it is always your right to say no thank you and wait for baby to nurse first. And even though we talked about babies nursing within that first hour, sometimes labor is just a big day on a mom and a baby. So as long as we have baby snuggled up skin to skin and baby is happy and content to be snuggled in with mom, this is a no pressure situation. Most babies will feed in that first hour, hour and a half, but we'll just follow baby's leads and watch for those early feeding cues. So snuggle in. We like babies to room in with their moms 24 hours a day while at the hospital and keep your babies close. That will help you get used to those newborn noises, help you get used to seeing what nighttime with the baby looks like while you have some good nursing care. It will also get baby off to a much better breastfeeding start so that when baby first starts to cue for hunger, hello, I'm getting kind of hungry and chewing on their little hands, sticking out their little tongue, they should give you about 10 to 15 minutes, plenty of time to wake up, figure out positioning, and try and work on a great latch. Studies also tell us that when moms room in with their babies, the moms get more sleep and a deeper sleep than if you would have sent your baby to the nursery. So keep those babies close. How often should baby eat each day? We need to see at least eight times a day, up to 12 plus. When babies were inside of you and they wanted a drink, all they did was swallow that amniotic fluid. We know that babies took little drinks up to 500 times a day while inside of you. 
So it's a big adjustment coming out to the real world. A full feeding on a newborn baby is probably going to take between 20 and 30 minutes because they're so little and they're still building up strength in their little jaw and cheeks. Plus it's warm milk and a soft mom. So they get kind of tired and sleepy. So we have to kind of wake them up again. But the more frequent of feedings in those first few weeks, the better your milk supply will be, the faster babies will gain weight and really get settled in to their new environment. As their tummies get bigger, they won't need to feed so often. After birth, we wanna encourage you to take family time. You guys have waited a long time to meet this baby, so you deserve those first couple of hours snuggled up skin to skin. If you read books to your baby while in utero, they will recognize those same books that you read outside of your stomach. Babies will also recognize the sounds that you've made to them this whole time or any songs that you've sung. So this is a great time to just snuggle in with the baby. There's lots of ways that we know that breastfeeding is going well. It's a big leap of faith nursing a baby because we can't see how much milk they're getting, but we have to trust that you could grow a baby very well, have a baby very well. There's no reason to think that your body won't be able to provide all the milk and nutrients necessary to grow this sweet baby. So the next few slides will tell us things to look for to know that breastfeeding is going well. So how do we know the babies are getting enough? We should see a baby pretty content after feedings. They don't give feeding cues for at least an hour and a half to two and a half hours. Uh, they may sleep or play. They seem pretty calm. Once a baby starts waking themselves for each feeding, we know that they're getting plenty of calories in because they have enough calories to wake up and feed. This is a better description of good feedings after babies are back to birth weight. Teeny tiny babies can get really sleepy and not feed very well, and then they don't have the calories to wake up and feed. So if your baby is waking to feed, that is a nice reassuring sign that they're getting good calories in. Once our mature milk is in and we have much more volume of milk than those first couple of days of colostrum, we'll start hearing swallowing. Babies will go suck, suck, swallow, suck, suck, swallow, suck, suck, swallow, sometimes a suck, swallow, suck, swallow, suck, swallow. If your milk letdown is really fast and goes spraying out into their little mouth, you'll start to see milk visible around their mouth, maybe running down the corner of their lips. And this baby, we're certainly not worried about her with the size of those cheeks. Baby's poop is the most reliable indicator if breastfeeding is going well and things are going great and babies are taking in enough milk. In the first one to three days, baby's poop should be black and thick and sticky. That's called meconium. It protected baby's intestines while they were inside of you. Your first milk, that colostrum, those sticky drops of antibodies, are also a laxative, and it will help baby get rid of that thick, tarry poop sooner than later. By day three or four, baby's poop should turn an army green, brown, kind of camo-ish color. This tells us your mature milk with much more volume is about ready to come in. It is a great reassuring sign. When baby's poop turns green, babies will probably be very hungry, very fussy. They're gonna wanna eat and eat and eat and eat. And when you think you fed them enough, they're gonna wanna eat some more. But all that extra demand on the breast means babies are going to bring your milk in faster than anything else. 
If your baby is still pretty sleepy, once you get home from the hospital, you can always feed a baby and then pump for 10 minutes afterwards. That just tells your milk, yeah, I know baby nursed a little bit, but I really want that milk to come in sooner than later. So pumping for 10 minutes after a feeding until that milk really comes in is a nice way to make that process a little faster. And then once your mature milk is in, baby's poop will turn a mustard yellow and it's kind of seedy looking. It's almost like mustard and cottage cheese mixed together. The only good thing about it is it doesn't smell as much as formula fed babies, so that's a nice perk. Whenever baby's poop goes to yellow, we know this baby is getting great milk and your milk is in. We like to see a lot of dirty diapers with a newborn baby. By day four, most breastfed babies should have three to four poopy diapers in a day. And we would like to see big puddly poo, not just a little smear. And if you have a diaper blowout, even better. Usually anything that babies are taking in, something will go out. So the more poopy diapers you have, the more reassurance that you have that babies are getting enough to eat. We also can watch for wet diapers. On day one, we should see one wet diaper. Day two, two wet diapers. Day three, three wet diapers. Day four, four wet diapers. Day five, five wet diapers. And then after that, baby should have six to eight soggy wet diapers a day. And that tells you that they're not dehydrated. Babies are going to lose a little bit of weight after they're born those first few days because they were swimming inside of you and now they're transitioning out of that. We don't want a baby to lose more than 7% of their body weight in those first two days. The hospital or birth center before you go home will weigh baby and let you know what percent of birth weight they have lost. So hopefully not more than 7%. After your milk comes in and baby's poop goes to that green to yellow, once we hit yellow poo and your milk is in, we should see about one ounce per day weight gain. And then we like to see babies back to their birth weight by two weeks. If you get Back to birth weight before then, that's amazing and you're doing fantastic. Mom's milk supply in her first couple of weeks will dictate your milk supply for however long you want to nurse this baby for. So the more milk you have in the beginning, the more milk you'll have for however long you want to nurse baby for. We know breastfeeding is going well if mom is comfortable during those feedings. Things are not sharp and pinchy, and if there's pain, we want to put your finger in the corner of their mouth, break suction, and try again on that latch. If mom is really sore, nipples are scabbed or bleeding on both sides and getting worse, then we know this baby is not taking on the amount of milk that they need to, and you can call your breastfeeding peer counselor and they can help you work on a plan to heal your nipples and protect your milk supply while we work on this latch. Remember, moms will always have enough for their babies in the first few days after birth. That first milk is called colostrum and it's all babies need for those first few days, just drops. Around day two or three, your milk will start to transition into a more mature milk and will become a little waterier and a little bit more in volume until around day three, four, five, your mature milk comes in with a lot more volume and is the milk that you would think that milk would be. We know that 
you tend to have enough milk to feed twins if you have one baby. If you have twins, you should have enough milk to feed triplets rather than your twins. It is always easier for your body to overproduce and then back off of that milk in those first few weeks than to not have enough milk when your baby is born. Let's look at a few different feeding positions. The position itself really doesn't matter as long as mom is comfortable with the latch and babies are gaining well. We know that moms and babies tend to be more comfortable in a laid back breastfeeding position. So rather than sitting up nice and proper, you're better off to lay back into your recliner, into your couch, on your hospital bed, and really get comfortable so baby just kind of falls into you. Babies like to feel very secure over their moms and not feel like they're falling. The baby on the right is laying over mom's chest while she's laying flat after her C-section. Laid back breastfeeding might be tricky if your breasts are very large, but with lots of pillows, you can get very comfortable while you feed your baby. This is the classic cradle position hold with the baby's head in the crook of your arm. The trouble with this position with a brand new baby is their heads are so floppy and they're so little, they usually need a little bit more support. So like the video showed earlier, Using mom's hand, thumb and forefinger behind each ear gives babies a little bit more support for that latch. However, once you get baby latched on and baby is nursing well, most moms can go back to this cradle hold, which is lots more comfortable for mom and frees up your other hand so that you can eat and drink. This is the cross cradle hold. So instead of baby cradled in your arm, you actually use the other arm to support baby, thumb and forefinger behind each ear, and that frees up your other arm to support your breast, squash it down to help baby get up and over that breast. Once baby's latched well, then you can relax back down into the cradle position, as mentioned in the last slide. This is the football hold. This is a great hold for anyone with larger breast, usually a B cup or bigger. This is great if you've had a C-section. It keeps all pillows and baby off of your incision. This is really good for little tiny babies because it allows moms to really get a good visual on how is that baby latching. So like the cross cradle, your arm supports baby and then thumb and finger, forefinger behind each ear. Baby comes up from underneath on the side or will kind of wrap around the side. The key to a football hold is there needs to be a pillow behind mom's back for a little extra room for this baby and pillow underneath baby maybe a couple pillows so that you bring a baby up to mom's breast and not lean forward to go down to a baby. We want moms very comfortable while they feed. Sideline nursing is a great way to rest as your baby feeds. It can be a little tricky. So once babies are pretty good at latching, it usually works a lot better. Mom's on her side, Baby's on his side facing mom's tummy. We line babies up nose to nipple and kind of arch back a little and then tuck them in close. Once baby starts to latch, then mom can get into that relaxed hold with one hand supporting baby's back and her other hand under her pillow or head. We just wanna make sure not to fall asleep with baby in the bed with us. So once feeding is done, you can pick up baby and place them on their back in a little bassinet or pack and play or crib near your bed or in your room. 
The next few slides are going to address some breastfeeding challenges that some moms may encounter while breastfeeding. We'll talk about engorgement or when your milk first starts to come in, nipple pain, blocked ducts, mastitis or that breast infection. We'll talk about baby's growth spurts and then returning back to work or school. So engorgement can occur when your more mature milk comes in anywhere between day two and five on average. You will start to notice your breasts feeling a little more firm, a little fuller, a little fuller. Some moms get really engorged, super full, rock hard, lumpy, milk has arrived. It is tricky for babies to latch on to a really full breast because it's like trying to suck on a softball. It just doesn't have enough squash to it to give this little one something to hold on to. So sometimes you might need to hand express or pump before a feeding to just get a little bit of milk out of the front part of that breast so that babies can latch on well, and then they will drain that milk out so fast. If you are still super full after a feeding and miserably full, my definition of miserably full is you can't sleep through what you're feeling, then go ahead and pump or hand express to soften your breast and let's get milk flowing. If you feel full, but not miserably full, and you could sleep through the fullness and take a nap, then ignore it. Let your breasts be full. That fullness will tell your body, hey, we don't need all this milk for twins. We just have one baby. So you'll start to back off on that milk production and downregulate to milk for one baby versus milk for two babies. What we don't want to do is pump after every single feeding once your milk is in because that tells your body, hey, we used all this milk and we could use some more, so make some more, please. Engorgement lasts for about two to three, well, one to two days. If you're taking ibuprofen for pain after delivery, you can continue to take ibuprofen. That will help with the inflammation in a breast. Cold feels really good on full breast. Maybe a bag of frozen peas in between feedings. The one thing to remember is before you feed or pump, if you've been using cold, you need to warm breast up prior to feeding so that that milk can flow freely. It's also good to have a nice supportive nursing bra available so that you have the support that you need during this engorgement period. Remember, it will be fast, only about 24 to 36 hours, plus you'll have the happiest baby ever with rivers and rivers of flowing milk. And then you should start to see that yellow poo. When we have these itty bitty baby mouths and these big breasts, sometimes it's really hard to get out of that first week without a little bit of nipple damage. This poor little nipple has scabs and a little blisters. So if you have nipple trauma or pain, sometimes your OB can write you a prescription for a Newman's or Hale's cream that will help heal that. You can think of that cream, that medicated cream, as nip neosporin for nipples. So you would only use that medicated cream if you had a prescription for it just while you had a scab or was bleeding. You can also use lanolin, that really thick breast cream. You can put a little bit on your nipple prior to feeding or prior to pumping that will help with the friction of these little mouths getting over the breast so that that nipple doesn't get any extra wear and tear to it. If you are really sore, uh, contact your peer counselor or an IBCLC lactation consultant in, from your hospital 
uh, to get a healing plan in place as soon as we can. If you can feed baby or pump without re-injuring your nipple, then you're well on your way to healing. Breasts always like to keep milk moving and flowing through. If milk starts to get backed up and not removed frequently, sometimes it kind of clogs up on those ducts and makes a dam. So all the milk behind it can't flow through. You know if you'd have a plug duct because you'd have this really tender sore spot that's kind of lumpy maybe pea size or bigger in your breast. It might be red or warm to the touch. If you notice a plug duct while feeding, I want you to try and massage gently before and behind and see if you can work that little bit of coagulated milk down and out through the nipple, that kind of sticky plug of a duct. Warm, moist heat works great. So in the shower or tub, put a washcloth over your breast and let that warm water just hit and sit on that breast. I would try to feed baby with its chin as close to the spot as you can. Sometimes that's some creative positioning. Sometimes we feed a baby while they're laying on the floor or the bed and we are hands and knees over them to let gravity try to pull that plug out while baby nurses. I would pump after you feed baby on that side to just try and get some additional vacuum force to try to pull that plug through. We usually have about 24 hours to clear that plug through before all of that milk that's been dammed up behind that plug gets infected. We call that mastitis. So don't ignore a tender hard spot and let's see if we can't massage that down and out through that nipple. If you find you have a plug duct that you can't clear and now that breast is becoming red, it's a giant hard spot, there might be some red streaks coming off of it, you have a fever, your body aches, you have chills. It feels like the worst flu ever. If you notice a fever and your breasts are tender and hot and swollen and sore like that, you need to call your OB immediately and they will prescribe some antibiotics for that infection. And you need to take the antibiotics immediately. Otherwise, that infection can get so much bigger and turn into an abscess before too long. So we always have to treat with antibiotics if you have that sore breast and fever combination. You'll start to feel a whole lot better within about 24 to 48 hours after starting antibiotics. But hopefully we can get those plug ducts cleared out sooner than later so mastitis never becomes an issue. Baby's growth spurts can be another tricky time with the breastfeeding mom. A baby will grow at kind of predictable times. Usually we see that around two to three weeks. Two weeks if baby was a little on the smaller side, usually three weeks if baby was on the larger side. We'll see it again at six weeks and 12 weeks. So when babies grow, it probably hurts to grow that fast and isn't so comfortable. So they get a little fussy, they want to be held, they seem very unsettled, fussy, oh, and they want to eat and eat and eat and eat, where you just fed them and a little bit later they act like they're starving, and then you feed them again and then they act like they're starving. These growth spurts are a baby's way of telling your body and milk, hey, I'm a growing baby, let's make some more milk, keep up with me. A growth spurt will last one, two, three days, a handful of days, and then baby will just settle down immediately when that growth spurt is over. Evening fussiness, that witching hour in the evening where babies are kind of overstimulated and fussy, tends to start at three weeks. 
it will peak at six weeks. So six weeks is the most fussy a baby should ever be in their entire life. This holds true for baby squirrels, baby foxes, baby hamsters. All babies get really restless and fussy around six weeks. That's also a really big growth spurt time. So babies will want to nurse and nurse and nurse. After the six-week growth spurt, each week gets better and better and better in terms of baby fussiness. And then the next big growth spurt will be at 12 weeks. Then we should be pretty smooth sailing, minus an occasional mini growth spurt here and there until six months when we start solids. So you can almost mark a growth spurt on your calendar. Um, this is especially tricky time if you're going back to work at six weeks or 12 weeks. Know that it's not just your transition back to work that's made baby fussy and unsettled and wants to eat. It's just a little growth spurt for them. If you're returning back to work or school after baby, it's good to visit with your manager or nurse or HR department before going on maternity leave to discuss that leave and your return back to work and setting up a pumping plan and where we're going to pump. You can text your breastfeeding peer counselor a few weeks before you go back to work and we can help you set up a back to work pumping plan to just get you and baby ready for that transition back to work. So if you're returning back to work or school, it's a good idea to start creating a stash of breast milk in your freezer so that you always have extra milk for baby. You wanna start saving those um, milk bags in increments of one ounce, two ounce, three ounce, and four ounce. No more than four ounces saved at a time. And while baby is still a newborn, you want a bunch of one, twos, and then eventually three and four ounces together. So that way, if you're running late coming home from work, your child care provider can just feed baby an ounce rather than thaw out four ounces of milk when you really wanted to come home and just nurse a baby rather than pump again. So having a wide variety of milk in the freezer is going to be helpful. Ideally, we could stash enough milk that would feed your baby for a week while you're away at work. Uh, two weeks if you're feeling rather ambitious and have a strong supply. You can pump for that supply first thing in the mornings when you're the most full, after a baby feeds or before a baby feeds, or maybe an hour after your baby feeds. Another great time to pump for your stash is while you nurse on one side, you can pump the other side because your breasts let down milk on both sides, so you might as well take advantage of that. You can still feed baby on the side that you just pumped. There will always be milk available for a baby. Your baby may squawk at you a little bit because she just wanted to come on the breast and go ah, and let it fall into her mouth. But if you can just get baby sucking enough over the next 30 minutes, not 30 minutes, 30 seconds, she'll get that big rush of milk that she's looking for and will be happy as a clam again. And then you can pump the side that she just left because you'll let down more milk on that side. It's nice to make sure that your child care provider is a breastfeeding friendly provider. There are many online courses for child care providers in the state of Kansas to help them support a breastfeeding mom. This is something your peer counselor can also go over with you. And then the last thing to know about going back to work as a nursing mom is we tend to have an ebb and flow of milk on your week back. On Mondays and Tuesdays, a lot of times we pump more milk than what you even need for baby for that day. On Wednesday, Thursday, you might pump just enough milk or a little less. And on Friday, you might not pump enough milk for this baby. But there's no panicking because as you go home Friday night and nurse a baby and then nurse all day Saturday, all day Sunday, your milk supply is up to full volume that next Monday.
So there's a gradual ebb and flow to a mom's milk supply when she returns back to work. So if on Friday you only pumped 10 ounces but needed 14 ounces for baby that day, you can pull an extra four ounces from your breastfeeding milk stash of freezer to make up the difference. That's where our stash comes into play. We also want to use your freshest milk first. So the milk you pump on Monday should feed baby on Tuesday. The milk you pump on Tuesday feeds Wednesday. Wednesday's milk feeds Thursday. Thursday feeds Friday. And then the milk you pump on Friday should feed baby on next Monday. So always use your freshest milk first because that's going to be the most current antibodies to keeping your baby safe and healthy during this cold and flu season. In your last month of pregnancy or so, I would call the number on the back of your insurance card and ask about getting a breast pump. All pregnant persons should be able to get a breast pump prior to having a baby. So find out what your insurance requires. Then you get to make your selection from the available pool. If you're going back to work, a double electric pump is what you're looking for. If you're just staying home with a baby, a double electric pump is still your fastest option to pump both breasts at the same time. Or you could use a single electric pump, but we're only being able to pump one breast at a time. A hand pump is another great option for a stay-at-home mom, or to have in addition to an electric pump so that you can just soften a breast if needed throughout the night or during that engorgement period. When we store our breast milk, Breast milk is good at room temperature for six hours. If you have a refrigerator nearby, I would go ahead and put it in the refrigerator. But if you pump milk in the middle of the night to relieve fullness, it means you can just leave your pump and milk on your nightstand and deal with it in the morning. Your milk is good for six days in the refrigerator and then six months in your kitchen freezer and then 12 months in your deep freeze. So I go by the rule of sixes. Six hours at room temperature, six days in the refrigerator, six months in the kitchen freezer, and 12 months in the deep freeze. The other thing to know about storing breast milk is you never want to put warm milk into the freezer. You always want to cool it down first. So if I just pumped a bottle of milk that I want to put in my freezer, I'm going to put it into my refrigerator first, cool it down, and once it's cool, then put it into the freezer. If I have two ounces of milk in the refrigerator and I just pumped two ounces of milk and I want to combine them into one bottle, I need to wait until I cool the just pumped milk down once it's cool, then I can pour the cool milk into the cool milk. You never want to pour warm milk into cold milk. Everything should try and be the same temperature for safe storage. Paste bottle feeding is a great way of feeding a breastfed baby from a bottle. It slows that flow of milk down so babies will be more likely to go back and forth between breast and bottle and not favor the bottle. This video is a great illustration of that. This is a great video for your child care providers to watch, for your partner, for your grandparents, anyone who's watching a baby while you're gone. This is a video for them to watch. When to call for breastfeeding help? I would call for help if baby's feeding every hour and there's been no growth spurt, if baby's feedings last more than an hour, if baby sleeps four to five hours more than once in a 24-hour period of time, 
If baby's sleeping that much, you're not able to get more than eight feedings in in a day. If you're feeding less than seven times in 24 hours, it's a good time to check in with a lactation specialist. If you're having severe nipple or breast pain or insufficient weight gain, those are all good times to call for help. We have tons of resources for breastfeeding support if you need a little help, have any questions or concerns, or just want to check in. All hospitals and birth centers will have a breastfeeding support group, and you don't even have to have had delivered at that hospital or birth center to go. You can text us, your WIC breastfeeding peer counselors, at any time. Stephanie runs the mission office, and I Vanessa do the Olathe office, but you can text either of us at any time. You can find a board certified lactation consultant. I am one at the Olathe office, or you can call your hospital breastfeeding helpline to set an appointment with lactation at the hospital. There are great internet sources. Kellymom.com and breastfeedinginc.canada is one of my all time favorite sources. Ask family and friends who are breastfeed. They have great advice and perspective. And we have local La Leche leagues all over the greater Kansas City area that you can find the link here. Don't forget, you can also ask for an IBCLC lactation consultant to come to your hospital room after you deliver to check on baby's latch, answer any questions, give you good ideas on positioning, and that is a free service as part of delivering in that hospital.